The Most Mysterious Visions of Ezekiel Number 1. Ophanim When God summoned Ezekiel to be a prophet, he was a young priest living as an exile in Babylon. This was a major change. A priest's responsibility was to go before God on behalf of the people. Priests have a difficult but relatively simple job. Prophets had a considerably more challenging task. A prophet went to the people on behalf of God. His responsibility was to say, Thus says the Lord. As a prophet stood before the people and declared God's judgments, he also had to show that what God was doing was righteous and just. His goal was to encourage the people and offer them a message of hope if they were prepared to listen to his word from the Lord. This was the task God assigned to Ezekiel. Ezekiel saw visions of God and the word of the Lord came directly to him. What he saw was astounding. His ministry was under divine mandate and authority. The Ophanim Ophanim is an ancient Hebrew word for wheels. The singular is often. Of course, wheels are cited several times in the Old Testament, and Ophanim can refer to normal wheels on a cart or chariot. But of particular interest are the wheels on the throne of God mentioned in Ezekiel's vision. Ophanim are mentioned in Ezekiel 1 verses 15 to 21. The mysteries of the universe, the heavens and spiritual creatures are revealed in the pages of the Bible so that we can better understand him. The Ophanim reveal our God as king and affirm the sovereignty of his reign. Ezekiel witnesses a foreboding cloud of lightning and flame coming from the direction of the north. Ezekiel 1 verses 15 to 19, New American Standard Bible. Now as I looked at the living beings, behold, there was one wheel on the ground beside the living beings for each of the four of them. The appearance of the wheel and their workmanship was like sparkling topaz, and all four of them had the same form, their appearance and workmanship being as if one wheel were within another. Whenever they moved, they moved in any of their four directions without turning as they moved. As for their rims, they were high and awesome, and the rims of all four of them were covered with eyes all around. Whenever the living beings moved, the wheels moved with them, and whenever the living beings rose from the earth, the wheels rose also. We read, a wheel was on the earth beside each living creature. What Ezekiel saw or described in this passage is difficult to visualize in its entirety. It is presumably an image of a magnificent chariot with four wheels that is bringing the throne of God. The scene gives the impression of continuous motion and activity, not only on the part of the living beings themselves, but also on the part of the throne that God sits on. Ezekiel 1 verse 26, New American Standard Bible. Now above the expanse that was over their heads, there was something resembling a throne, like lapis lazuli in appearance, and on that which resembled the throne high up was a figure with the appearance of a man. We read, when they moved, they went toward any one of four directions. They did not turn aside when they went. The sense seems to be that the wheels and their workings could move in any direction, but there was no sense of chaos or disorder to their movements. A popular Bible commentator stated about this, like a ball bearing, they could move in any direction without any steering mechanism. As for their rims, they were so high they were awesome, and their rims were full of eyes. Again, it is difficult to image in one's mind exactly what Ezekiel saw or stated in this passage. The description of full of eyes was how John described the cherubim themselves. The sense is of excellent knowledge and intelligence. They are not dead metal. Their livingness is shown by their eyes with which they can see the way and by their lifelink with the living creatures above them. 
Ophanim are also mentioned similarly in Ezekiel 10 verses 9 to 13. Ezekiel 10 verses 9 to 13, New American Standard Bible. Then I looked, and behold, four wheels beside the cherubim, one wheel beside each cherub, and the appearance of the wheels was like the gleam of a tarnished stone. And as for their appearance, all four of them had the same likeness, as if one wheel were within another wheel. When they moved, they went in any of their four directions without turning as they went, but they followed in the direction which they faced without turning as they went. And their whole body, their backs, their hands, their wings, and the wheels were covered with eyes all around, the wheels belonging to all four of them. The wheels were called, as I heard, the whirling wheels. We read, there were four wheels by the cherubim. Ezekiel 1 verse 15, 21 described these wheels in some detail. The general impression is of constant activity, motion, and free movement with no chaos or disorder. They did not turn aside when they went, but followed in the direction the head was facing. The image seems bizarre to the modern reader, but one must remember that this is a visionary experience and surrealistic features may overwhelm realism. What did the Ophanim reveal about God? Both in appearance and operation, the Ophanim that appear in Ezekiel's vision demonstrate God's absolute dominion over the entire cosmos. The omnidirectional wheels themselves serve as a constant reminder to us that the God we serve is omnipresent, meaning that he is able to be in all places at all times. As the Spirit of God guides the cherubim, Ezekiel 1 verse 12, that same Spirit indwells the Ophanim. When the creatures moved, they also moved. When the creatures stood still, they also stood still. And when the creatures rose from the ground, the wheels rose along with them, because the spirit of the living creatures was in the wheels. Ezekiel 1 verse 20. This symbolic unity of submission displays God's supreme authority and right to rule and reign, his omnipotence. And the eyes that cover the wheels and the cherubim are symbolic of God's omniscience. He is all-seeing all-knowing. Why is it important for Christians to know about the supernatural realm? In Ephesians 6 verse 12, we are told that our struggle is not against flesh. God desires believers to be aware of the world beyond what our temporal eyes can see, so that we, in the Lord's mighty power, can be prepared to take on whatever scheme the enemy has in store. Number 2. Cherubim The cherubim are a group of celestial beings created by God. Although Ezekiel meets them, they are the first of the angelic hierarchy to appear in the Bible, immediately following Adam and Eve's fall from grace. Genesis 3 records the events in the Garden of Eden. Having violated God's commandment not to partake of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, it would have been likely for Adam and Eve to reach out their hands and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. As a result, they were forced to leave their earthly paradise. But what would have stopped Adam from going back to the garden and disobeying God again? The answer is given in this verse. Genesis 3 verse 24, New American Standard Bible. So he drove the man out. And at the east of the Garden of Eden he stationed the cherubim and the flaming sword which turned every direction to guard the way to the Tree of Life. We don't know Adam's reaction to witnessing those glorious cherubim for the first time in human history. Perhaps awe, fright, and wonder are all emotions that come to mind. Cherubim are real and powerful beings. However, the cherubim in the Bible were often representative of heavenly things. They were integrated into the design of the Ark of the Covenant and the tabernacle at God's command. 
Ezekiel 10 verses 1 to 9, New American Standard Bible. Then I looked, and behold, in the expanse that was over the heads of the cherubim, something like a sapphire stone, in appearance resembling a throne, appeared above them. And he spoke to the man clothed in linen, and said, Enter between the whirling wheels under the cherubim, and fill your hands with coals of fire from between the cherubim, and scatter them over the city. And he entered in my sight. Now the cherubim was standing on the right side of the temple when the man entered, and the cloud filled the inner courtyard. Then the glory of the Lord went up from the cherubim to the threshold of the temple, and the temple was filled with the cloud, and the courtyard was filled with the brightness of the glory of the Lord. Moreover, the sound of the wings of the cherubim was heard as far as the outer courtyard, like the voice of God Almighty when he speaks. And it came about when he commanded the man clothed in linen, saying, Take fire from between the whirling wheels from between the cherubim. He entered and stood beside a wheel. Then the cherubim reached out with his hand from between the cherubim to the fire which was between the cherubim, took some coals, and put them into the hands of the one clothed in linen, and he took them and went out. The cherubim appeared to have something like a human hand under its wings. Then I looked, and behold, four wheels beside the cherubim, one wheel beside each cherub, and the appearance of the wheels was like the gleam of a tarnished stone. The cherubim are shown in Ezekiel 10 as having not only wings and hands, but also being full of eyes, encompassed by wheels within wheels. However, Ezekiel also paints a gloomy tone in chapter 10, and the cherubim provide the hint. The prophet presents his vision that prophesies the destruction of Jerusalem. In Ezekiel 9 verse 3, the Lord has descended from his throne above the cherubim to the threshold of the temple, while in 10 verse 1, he returns again to take his seat above them. In the calm before the storm, we see the cherubim stationed on the south side of the sanctuary. Being stationed in position toward the city, they witness the beginning of the gradual withdrawal of God's glory from Jerusalem. The fluttering of their wings indicates immensely important events to follow. 10 verse 5 then the cherubim rise up in preparation for the departure. While Ezekiel 10 is difficult to understand, one point comes across clearly. The inner sanctuary of God's throne is always open to those who have repented of sin and trusted Christ as Savior. Ezekiel 24 verses 14 to 16, New American Standard Bible. You were the anointed cherub who covers and I place you there. You were on the holy mountain of God. You walked in the midst of the stones of fire. You were blameless in your ways from the day you were created until righteousness was found in you. By the abundance of your trade, you were internally filled with violence and you sinned. Therefore, I have cast you as profane from the mountain of God and I have destroyed you, you covering cherub, from the midst of the stones of fire. Number 3. Valley of Dry Bones In the time of Ezekiel, difficult times prevailed. Zedekiah was Judah's final puppet king. The city was under siege, and Zedekiah was taken prisoner by Nebuchadnezzar's army. They executed each of his sons in front of him so that he could see that there was no one left in the royal lineage to succeed him. They proceeded to remove his eyes, which meant that the last thing he witnessed was the death of his sons. Then Nebuchadnezzar ordered the total destruction of Jerusalem. Even though Ezekiel was living in Babylon, thousands of miles away from Jerusalem at the time, he received the call to preach around this time. After God had commanded Ezekiel to prophesy the rebirth of Israel, God then showed him a vision of the Valley of Dry Bones. 
Ezekiel 37 verses 1 to 3, New American Standard Bible. The hand of the Lord was upon me, and he brought me out by my spirit of the Lord and set me down in the middle of the valley, and it was full of bones. He had me pass among them all around, and behold, there were very many on the surface of the valley, and behold, they were very dry. Then he said to me, Son of man, can these bones live? And I answered, Lord God, you yourself know. Ezekiel's great prophetic experience is not precisely called a vision, but that seems to be the sense of the phrase, brought me out in the spirit of the Lord. Ezekiel saw a wide open space, a valley. This was Death Valley. The valley floor was so densely packed with human bones that it was described as full of bones. Ezekiel noticed them all around him, especially in the open valley. The people represented by these bones were not only dead, but also disgraced. An unburied remain with exposed remains was considered a shocking disgrace to the dead in ancient Israel and the ancient Near East. These bones were clearly not properly buried. The bones lay on the surface of the valley like the remains of remains denied a proper burial and left for scavenging buzzards. As an Israelite and especially as a priest, Ezekiel understood the significance of proper human treatment. Apart from their presence in a living body, bones are dead. Dry bones are not only dead, they have been long dead. Bones are what remain when life has passed. Something that never had life would not leave bones. However, when something has been dead for a long time, we lose hope that it will ever come back to life. One might hope that a recently deceased corpse will resuscitate. Nobody believes that scattered, detached bones will survive. Ezekiel responded admirably to God's question with the only hope available, saying, O oh Lord God, you know. Ezekiel had no hope in the bones, but he did have hope in God. Ezekiel did not assume to know what God wanted to do with the bones. Ezekiel was assured that God did know. Ezekiel 37 verses 4 to 6, New American Standard Bible. Again he said to me, Prophecy over these bones and say to them, You dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. This is what the Lord God says to these bones. Behold, I am going to make breath enter you so that you may come to life and I will attach tendons to you, make flesh grow back on you, cover you with skin, and put breath in you so that you may come to life, and you will know that I am the Lord. Ezekiel purposefully left the matter to God, to his power and wisdom in the previous verse. In turn, God assigned a task to the prophet. God gave him the command to speak, to prophesy to the dry dead bones, from the outside, this appeared to be a vain and foolish act. Ezekiel could only preach this message full of faith in God, yet if he was convinced that he spoke the word of the Lord, he knew God's word had mystical power. I will surely cause breath to enter into you, and you will live, God promised to breathe life into the dry bones. He promised to put flesh on those bones and skin over them, God would resurrect the once dead and dry bones. The bones could never create life by themselves. As the word of the Lord was proclaimed over them, they received God's promise of life. The life would be marked by breath, living once again in these bones. This has a dual sense because the ancient Hebrew words for breath and spirit are the same. This was a granting of God's spirit and a restoration of life-giving breath. Ezekiel 37 verse 27, New American Standard Bible. And I will put my spirit within you, and bring it about you, that you walk in my statutes and are careful and follow my ordinances. At its root, ruah, 
denotes the sense of air in motion. This can change from a gentle breeze to a raging wind or from a breath to a raging passion. It has come to represent both man's spirit or disposition as well as emotional qualities such as vigor, courage, impatience, and ecstasy. It includes not only a man's vital breath, which is given to him at birth and leaves his body on his dying gasp, but also the Holy Spirit who imparts that breath. Such is the rich variety of the word used here by Ezekiel. The resurrection that follows does not refer directly to individual resurrection from death, it is symbolic of the recreation and revitalizing of the nation as a whole, as the interpretation shows. Ezekiel 37 verses 7 to 8, New American Standard Bible. So I prophesied as I was commanded, and as I prophesied, there was a loud noise, and behold, a rattling, and the bones came together, bone to its bone, and I looked, and behold, tendons were on them, and flesh grew and skin covered them, but there was no breath in them. If Ezekiel had any doubts, he put them aside and followed God's instructions. This proclamation of God's word appeared foolish to human eyes, but Ezekiel obeyed. As Ezekiel prophesied, there was first a rattling among the bones. As he continued, the bones began to assemble themselves into skeletons. The text does not specifically say, but it can be assumed that the bones assembled themselves properly, as skeletons and not weird combinations of bones. When God restores, he puts things together in the right way. Muscles and tissue grew up around the bones after they were put together. The bones were alive with activity, but they lacked the breath of life. The dry bones were clearly resurrected in stages. The sequence involving bones, sinews, flesh, and skin reflects an understanding of anatomy available to anyone who had witnessed the slaughter of an animal. It also reverses the decomposition process. The body is the soul's sheath, the soul's suit. The upper garment is the skin, the inner, the flesh, the innermost of all, bones and sinew. So here were men in skin with flesh, sinews, bones. But like Adam before inspired the breath of life, the spirit of life was yet wanting. There is no teaching in the scriptures that the resurrection of anyone from physical death will take place in stages, such as is stated here for the dried bones of the people of Israel. Ezekiel 37 verses 9 to 10, New American Standard Bible. Then he said to me, Prophecy to the breath, prophecy, son of man, and say to the breath, The Lord God says this, Come from the four winds, breath, and breathe on these slain, so that they come to life. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and the breath entered them, and they came to life and stood on their feet, an exceedingly great army. The previous verse left the valley teeming with resurrected, activated bodies that still lacked breath. Now Ezekiel was told to call upon the breath, spirit, wind, praying the breath, slash spirit, would come on these slain, that they may live. Ezekiel had already proclaimed God's word to the dead and dry bones in this vision, and he had witnessed a remarkable work. However, it was not enough. The Holy Spirit's work was also required. So I prophesied as he commanded me. He had the incentive of seeing the beginning of a supernatural work with the activation of the dry bones. Now he prophesied and prayed for the work to be achieved. After Ezekiel's faithful proclamation of God's message, the work of reviving the dry bones was completed. The breath of God came into the reanimated bodies, and they stood upon their feet. The work of reviving the dry bones was completed after Ezekiel's faithful proclamation of God's message. God's breath entered the reanimated bodies, and they stood on their feet.
Decayed churches can most certainly be revived by the preaching of the word accompanied by the coming of the heavenly breath from the four winds. The bones were not brought back to life to become a group of spectators or to live for their own sake. They grew into an army, and a very large one at that. They lived to carry out the commands of the one who gave them life. We read of an exceedingly great army. So the Hebrew, or army of strong, courageous, and well-ordered soldiers, the phrase in Hebrew is very full, a power or great host, very, very great. Thus they rise that the prophet and we might know how safe they would be in themselves and how terrible to their enemies. With all word and no spirit, we can be an army of the dead, solid, but without the true breath of life. Ezekiel 37 verses 11 to 14, New American Standard Bible. Then he said to me, Son of man, these bones are the entire house of Israel. Behold, they say, our bones are dried up and our hope has perished. We are completely cut off. Therefore prophecy and say to them, this is what the Lord God says. Behold, I am going to open your graves and cause you to come up out of your graves. My people, I will bring you into the land of Israel. Then you will know that I am the Lord when I have opened your graves and caused you to come up out of your graves, my people. And I will put my spirit within you and you will come to life and I will place you on your own land. Then you will know that I, the Lord, have spoken and done it, declares the Lord. We could assume that Ezekiel realized the bones in his vision represented his people. However, God's revelation that they represented the entire house of Israel, not just those from the kingdom of Judah, may have surprised him. Those from the northern kingdom of Israel, which fell to the Assyrians 150 years ago, would be included in the restoration. Our bones are dry, our hope is lost, and we ourselves are cut off. Both the southern and northern houses of Israel had reason to say this. God was their only hope for survival and restoration. I will open your graves and cause you to come up. The same message is conveyed via a slightly different picture. Instead of the bones being exposed, here they are buried in graves. The result is the same. Life is brought to that which was dead. We read, I will put my spirit in you, and you shall live. The breath in the resurrected bones was more than just human breath. It was the spirit of the living God. This chapter in Ezekiel contains a lot of applications. First and foremost, God accomplishes what he sets out to do. He not only meets our physical necessities, but he goes above and beyond. God recognizes that we have a profound spiritual need that can only be met by Him. We can't survive without Him because we can't breathe without the breath of life. Second, it makes no difference how much we have messed up or fallen into sin. God can repair all things, no matter how dry our bones have gotten. Ezekiel's task was not to be successful in the human sense. Instead, he was to be truthful in stating, This is what the Lord God says. Ezekiel's favored title for God was the compound name Lord God or Adonai Yahweh. He used it over 200 times. Number 4. Gog Gog and Magog Ezekiel 38 and 39 offer one of the most remarkable but difficult to comprehend predictions in the Bible. These chapters foretell of a northern invasion of Israel that will arrive like a storm and cover the land like a cloud. Israel will appear to be doomed, yet God will intercede in this attack. Ezekiel 38 verses 8 to 16, Amplified Bible. After many days, you will be summoned for service. 
In the latter years you shall come into the land that is restored from the ravages of the sword, where people have been gathered out of many nations to the mountains of Israel, which had been a continual wasteland. But its people were brought out of the nations, and they were living securely, all of them. You will go up against them, you will come like a storm, you shall be like a cloud covering the land, you and all your troops and many peoples with you. Thus says the Lord God, it will come about on that day that thoughts will come into your mind, and you will devise an evil plan, and you will say, I will go up against an open country. I will come against those who are at rest and peaceful, who live securely, all of them living without walls and having neither bars nor gates to take spoil and seize plunder, to turn your hand against the ruins which are now inhabited, and against the people who are gathered from the nations, who have acquired cattle and goods, who live at the center of the world, Israel, Sheba and Dedan, and merchants of Tarnish, southern Spain, with all its young lions, villages, will say to you, Have you come to take spoil? Have you assembled your hordes of fighting men to seize plunder, to carry away silver and gold, to take away cattle and goods, to take great spoil? Therefore, son of man, prophecy and say to Gog, Thus says the Lord God, On that day when my people Israel live securely, will you not become aware of it and become active? Will you come from your place in the remote parts of the north, you and many nations with you, all of them riding horses, a great horde, and a mighty army, and you will go up against my people Israel like a cloud to cover the land? In the last days it will come about that I will bring you against my land, so that the nations may know me when I show myself holy through you before their eyes, O Gog. Because we are told that the invasion of Gog will take place in the latter years or days, this prophecy could be fulfilled in the first part of the tribulation. This is because the Antichrist will have a solution to the Middle East dilemma and will sign a seven-year peace deal with Israel during the tribulations. The invasion will thereafter take place. God had promised to revive Israel from the dead through the vision Ezekiel received of the Valley of Dried Bones. As exiles in the foreign land of Babylon, the Israelites had lost faith, but God assured them that they would once again live as a nation, now the Lord continued to convey the wonderful hope and future He has for the children of Israel. Ezekiel 37 verses 1 to 11, New King James Version. Chapter 38 introduces us to Gog and Magog. The name Gog refers to the leader of the land of Magog. We are merely told that these occurrences will take place in the later days. The invasion of Israel will come from the north according to God's word. Ezekiel 39 verse 2, Amplified Bible And I will turn you around and lead you along, and bring you up from the remotest parts of the north, and I will bring you against the mountains of Israel. Ezekiel 38 verses 4 to 6 I will turn you around and put hooks in your jaw, and I will bring you out, and all your army, horses and horsemen, all of them magnificently clothed in full armor, a great horde with buckler, small shield, and large shield, all of them wielding swords, Persia, Iran, Cush, Ethiopia, and Put, Libya, North Africa, with them, all of them with shield and helmet, Gomer and all its troops, Beth Togamar from the remote parts of the north and all its troops, many peoples with you. Gog will not act alone in this invasion, but will be aided by a coalition of nations. Many Bible teachers believe Gomer refers to Germany, whereas Togamar refers to Turkey. In terms of this coalition, 
these countries will only believe they are in command. The coalition's attack, according to God, is meant to loot and destroy Israel. This is not a recent concept. Even now, many Middle Eastern countries openly oppose Israel. Any country that is a friend of Israel is viewed as a foe by these countries. Ezekiel 38 verses 19 to 23, Amplified Bible. In my zeal and in my blazing rage, I declare that on this day there will most certainly be a great earthquake in the land of Israel, so that the fishes of the sea, the birds of the sky, the animals of the field, all the creatures that crawl on the earth, and all the men that are on the face of the earth will tremble and shake at my presence. The mountains will crumble, the steep places will fall, and every wall will fall to the ground. I will call for a sword against Gog throughout all my mountains, says the Lord God. Every man's invading soldier's sword will be against his brother, ally, in panic and confusion. With pestilence and with bloodshed, I will enter into judgment with Gog, and I will rain on him torrents of rain with great hailstones, fire and brimstone on his hordes, and on the many nations that are with him. Thus I shall magnify myself and demonstrate my greatness and sanctify myself, and I will be recognized and will make myself known in the sight of many nations. They will know without any doubt that I am the Lord." God informs us that he will allow this invasion so that the nations of the world would be compelled to realize who he is when he intervenes and exhibits his righteousness. The Lord expresses his rage at this invasion. The phrasing in verse 19 is reminiscent of an earthquake or maybe a nuclear bomb. In verse 20, we observe the aftermath of the disaster. Natural calamities, confusion, and terror will be used by God to kill these invaders. When he has done with Gog and his coalition, everyone will know that God is in power. Gog's Annihilation Ezekiel 39 verses 1 to 6, Amplified Bible And you, son of man, prophecy against Gog, Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I am against you, O Gog, chief prince ruler of Meshech and Tubal, and I will turn you around and lead you along and bring you up from the remotest parts of the north, and I will bring you against the mountains of Israel. I will strike your bow from your left hand and make your arrows to fall out of your right hand. You will fall dead on the mountains of Israel, you and all your troops and the nations who are with you. I will give you every kind of predatory bird and animal of the field as food. You will fall in the open field, for I have spoken, says the Lord God. I will also send fire on Magog and on those who live securely in the coastlands, and they will know without any doubt that I am the Lord. Chapter 39 continues to inform us about the destruction of the alliance of countries with a focus on Gog and his land of Magog. The Lord began by emphasizing his opposition to Gog. Then he displayed the coalition's total annihilation. Five-sixths of God's invading army will be defeated. Their weapons will be powerless against the Lord. Ezekiel 39 verses 7 to 15, Amplified Bible. I will make my holy name known in the midst of my people Israel. I will not let them profane my holy name any more, and the nations will know that I am the Lord, the Holy One of Israel. Behold, it is coming, and it will be done, says the Lord God. That is the day of which I have spoken. And when you, Gog, no longer exist, those who live in the cities of Israel will go out and make fires with the weapons and burn them, both the large shields and the bucklers, small shields, the bows and arrows, the war clubs and spears, and for seven years they will burn. They will not take any wood from the field or cut down and gather any firewood from the forests, 
because they will make their fires using the weapons, and they will take the spoil from those who despoiled them and seize the plunder of those who plundered them, says the Lord God. And on that day, I will give Gog a place for burial there in Israel, the valley of those who pass through the east of the sea, and it will block the way of those who would pass through. So they will bury Gog there with all his hordes, and they will call it the Valley of Hamon Gog, multitude of Gog. For seven months, the house of Israel will be burying them in order to cleanse the land. Yes, all the people of the land will bury them, and it will be to their renown on the day that I appear in my glory and brilliance, says the Lord God. They will elect men who will constantly go through the land, men commissioned to bury those who were passing through, those bodies that lie unburied on the surface of the ground in order to cleanse it. At the end of the seven months, they will do a search. As those who pass through the land pass through and anyone sees a human bone, he will set up a marker beside it until the buriers have buried it in the valley of Hamongog. God's people will have adequate fuel for the next seven years thanks to the weapons. Seven months will be required for them to bury the dead. Special teams will be tasked in finding and burying any remaining deceased bodies.